Uh, so thanks for coming, everybody. How's your first day? First day of talks, anyway. Great. Good. Uh, so I'm the only thing. Excuse me. <clears throat> Got a bit of a, a cold that I'm coming off of. Um, so I'm the only thing holding you from uh, the talks and the rest of your evening. So thanks for uh, thanks for bearing with me. Um, and this talk was actually originally accepted as one of the deep dive talks. Um, due to some of my own gross incompetence. Uh, I had a scheduling conflict, so thanks to the organizers for uh, accommodating me uh, today instead. And thanks to all the volunteers and uh, to those doing the, the captioning up here and um, for making this conference great. So um, I'll talk a little bit about myself, um, give you an idea of who I am and, and how I came into Django and how Django plays a role uh, in my life now. And uh, first, this is kind of who I am on the internet, uh, so you can find me on the web or on Twitter or GitHub, uh, whatever your sort of preferred medium is. And throughout the talk, uh, my, my Twitter handle is there on the bottom. Um, so if you have a question or something uh, that you don't want to lose track of, uh, feel free to ask me as I'm giving this talk. Um, so I work at Ithaca. And Ithaca is a nonprofit organization in higher education space. Uh, and we do uh, sort of a lot of things helping with academic research and uh, digital preservation of documents and things. And specifically, I work on JSTOR. And JSTOR is an academic uh, database, online database, as well as a research platform. Um, and I guess the way that I came into Django was sort of by by personal uh, use first. Um, so I am a photographer, and uh, this photo in the middle here was taken in Mexico a couple weeks ago, um, where I received the worst, worst sunburn of my adult life. Um, so visiting sunny California was obviously the next natural step. Um, and uh, the photo on the, on the right is also in Joshua Tree, which is not too far from here. Um, but I kind of had tried a couple other frameworks uh, and a couple other languages um, along the way in building, my, in building my site. I needed something that could allow me to upload photos and organize them in different ways and maybe do blog posts and uh, let customers contact me and things like that. Um, and none of these frameworks that I had been trying kind of resonated with me, um, but I ultimately gave Django a try. Uh, after having seen a little bit of Python, uh, and I've kind of just been going with it ever since. Um, and it's been a joy to work with, and I try to use it where I can. So uh, back, to, back to JSTOR. Around 2014 is when I joined the organization. And at the time, we were on this big proprietary CMS. Um, and it was a little bit it was a little bit difficult to change. I mean, think about uh, developers doing these like day-long or multiple day-long trunk merge activities, um, trying to get everyone's changes from the last however long it had been uh, into the next release, and um, people scrambling to make sure their stuff worked so that it could get into the next release, um, because who knows how long it could be till the next one. Um, and there was also sort of low visibility into problems that uh, might arise. Um, so anytime something was wrong, um, we had a lot of digging to do to be able to kind of surmise what was going on. And so around 2014, I, I joined, and we were in the middle of a project to get out of this situation. And so we were, at the time, uh, breaking this big CMS up into a variety of microservices um, and moving a lot of those services onto uh, an AWS platform. And that allowed us to do um, sort of these microservices for the back end as well as front end consumer applications, uh, consuming those APIs, and then uh, do a lot better things like application health monitoring and continuous integration uh, and auto scaling too. So this is kind of where Django enters the picture. Um, and uh, I, it was kind of a good pairing at the time because I had learned Django and I, was, I had been using it for a year or two uh, at the time. And I, so I knew enough to be dangerous. Um, and then I also wanted the challenge of, of learning a lot more of these detailed pieces of, of Django that I had yet to explore. Um, so 
signed on. And uh, kind of the approach that we, that we took with our applications is to uh, not just have one project with many applications, but actually to have several different distinct projects. Uh, and this allowed us to do better fault tolerance uh, and better independent performance profiling and auto-scaling. Uh, so when, say, Google crawls the website and is hitting the, the article viewing application heavily, we don't also want search to break under that heavy load. Um, so we wanted to maintain some amount of, of uh, isolation between these applications. And then uh, at the same time, we also wanted them still to share a number of things. Uh, we wanted them to all do authentication the same way. Uh, handle permissions the same way, uh, doing look and feel and search forms and all that kind of stuff the same way. Um, so being able to centralize some of the business logic um, was still was still of big value to us. And so uh, it kind of whoops sorry, it kind of ended up looking like this. And uh, so we we made this installable app that had all of our shared templates, and um, we would install that app into each of the, each of the consuming front-end applications in which we needed to use it. Um, this might be a practice that you're pretty familiar with. If you use Django, you install a plugin, you add it to your installed apps, uh, you can use all the templates from it, and so on. So uh, this felt natural at the time, and we were pretty happy with it for a while. Um, but as we kind of grew and started breaking out more pieces of the CMS, we ended up with more applications, uh, more distinct applications. And ultimately, um, the problem we ran into was that these changes to look and feel required uh, deployment to basically every consumer, right? Um, and so if you imagine that each app has to have this navigation at the top, um, if you need to add one link to the navigation, you have to deploy all 37 applications that need to show the application, uh, need to show the navigation rather, and that wasn't great. Um, so we were starting to feel these pains and didn't really, didn't really have a great idea where we wanted to go with it next. Um, but the, the way we sort of approached this was to write down uh, what we wanted out of it and what, what it needed to achieve, and then we could go from that and try and find a solution. So the desires really were for all these consumers that we have, all these front-end applications, to uh, be able to receive these updates uh, without a deployment in as near real time as we could do it, and in some way that would not actually affect the page load performance for our users uh, in, a, in a bad way uh, or in an impactful way. And so this kind of started to sound like a service that would, that would serve templates. Um, we didn't know exactly what that meant at the time, um, but that's, that's kind of what we wanted. We needed something that was a central place that all these applications could go and ask for a specific template and then receive the content of that template. Uh, and then that, temp that service could be the one place to, uh, to make those updates so that all these apps could then reap the benefits of those updates. And after quite a bit of digging and thinking and uh, reading a lot of documentation, we settled on custom template loaders. And uh, so the rest of this talk is kind of going to cover this concept. And so we'll cover a little bit about what these actually are and how we use them at JSTOR and some of the things that it helped us achieve. Uh, and then also some of the things we have kind of yet to do to, to reach where we're trying to go. So first off, uh, we'll kind of go into what they really are. So this picture might be something you're used to if you've used Django for some time now. Um, you've seen it probably in some other form, either in the Django docs or a number of blog posts kind of cover this, but essentially there's these layers of of the request lifecycle that happen when someone requests a page on your site. And so it starts by going down through the web server and gets translated through the WSGI layer into something that Python can understand. And then there's this middleware layer uh, that allows you to intercept that request as it comes in, make some changes or add information to it, 
and then uh, within the view is where you have kind of your, your business logic happening, and then you ultimately render a template, which flows back up the stack ultimately into this response that users see. And this maybe is nothing new for you, um, but what, we've, what we really wanted to attack was like the part that happens underneath that. <laughs> um, so that's the part we had never really seen or thought about before. Um, and it turned out that template loaders are that piece. Um, and like most things in Django, it provides a very reasonable and pluggable and um, easy way to kind of get to that piece of the request lifecycle. So uh, it, the, the template loader's job is ultimately to accept a template name and then return that template's content. Um, and that, going back to our desires, is kind of, kind of where we wanted to head. So there are a few template loaders installed by default, uh, well, available by default in Django and installed by default uh, if you haven't specified your own. And uh, the file system loader will look for templates within your project, and then the app directories loader will look for template directories within each of your apps that are installed, and then the cached loader will wrap some number of other loaders uh, so that subsequent requests for those templates uh, don't involve additional processing each time. And um, there's, there's, I think, a couple others that are also available. Um, but they're in the docs if you'd like to learn more about those. And again, its main job is to, you know, given a template name, return that template's content. And so a simple, uh, a simple way to do that is to subclass the base loader class. And there's these two methods, get template sources and get contents, that uh, are, are sort of the meat of things. Um, and the get template sources method is meant to get all the possible locations where that loader knows it could look for a template. It doesn't actually have to check that they're there, um, but just return a list of locations where it might be. And then get contents will iterate over those locations, check if the template is available there, and if so, return the content. And um, if it goes through this process and ultimately can't, uh, can't find any template, then it raises a template does not exist which will then kind of defer to later loaders uh, to try and find the template being asked for. So um, this is, this is uh, kind of the, the flow that we wanted to intercept. Um, this is not good. Um, I don't know what that slide was. Uh, I think this was just <laughs> to, I think this slide was just showing um, that you can add that loader into Django by, uh, there's like in the, in the settings.py file, there's the templates setting with an options setting within that, and then there's a loaders option that you can configure a list of, of loaders. So you would uh, just point it to the, the dotted string uh, path of that, dotted path string of that loader. So, uh, how did we how did we use this? How did we get what we wanted using a template loader? Ultimately, it looked like this. So uh, when we when we get down into that template rendering process, we are now have now have this way to intercept uh, the loading process using this loader class. And what we can do in that loader class is check if this is an, a, a template that we are interested in loading from this remote service. And if it is, then we can check if that template content is already in a cache of some kind. And if it is, we can return that template content that's been cached. And if not, we can fetch it from the service, which will cache it, and then return that content. Um, and if it's not a template that we care to fetch from the remote service, we can just raise template does not exist because the future loaders uh, that are the, the default Django loaders, file system loader, app directories loader, um, will then be able to, to look where they normally would in the local file system for those, uh, for those template content. So the templates that we want to fetch from the service, like the navigation and the layouts that we have and the footer, uh, will go be fetched remotely, 
and uh, all the sort of app-specific templates and things like that can be fetched as they normally would be. So that part on the right there is kind of the get contents part. Um, and the part on the, the left is the get template sources part, referring back to that loader API. And architecturally, this looks somewhat like this. So if we have an articles application, uh, the first thing it will do when trying to render a template and it knows that it's one of these remote templates that it needs to fetch, it will go to the service to check if it's available. If not, it will call this template delivery service and that will check the database for that content and retrieve it and then put it in the cache and then ultimately return it to the application. So uh, basically we wanted to check obviously if this meet, met all of our desires, uh, first of all. And so uh, consumers could receive those updates without deployment anytime we wanted to put a new version of a template up, we would simply add it to the service uh, and that update would propagate in a way that those, those apps could ask for it and get the updated content. Uh, in near real time, pretty close. The biggest thing is the network call to the cache or the network call to the service. Um, and those things can be improved uh, with, with bigger machines and horizontal scaling. Um, and without affecting page load performance, so with heavy caching and things like that, um, most times if a user requests a page, they'll be getting cached content. Um, and the, the increase in, in page load time there was fairly negligible for us. So um, it kind of checked all the boxes. And some other things that it kind of got us were this ability to do per user configuration for testing changes to those templates. So we have uh, kind of this live configuration system that we use for feature flags and setting string parameters and things like that. So coupled with this, um, we could pretty easily enable new versions of templates just for ourselves uh, for testing purposes and do things like browse the site with changes to the navigation, the footer, the layout, everything like that. And it made it easy to test impact of changes like uh, adding preload or prefetch, uh, preconnect tags. Uh, to our pages and things like that too. So uh, this was a pretty nice kind of fringe benefit. And we built a, a system around making this easier for ourselves, um, which looks like this. So you can kind of select the layout that you're interested in updating, uh, specify which version of the template you want to, to add, um, make a description for what that change actually does upload a new file and uh, put your name as the, as the person who uploaded it just as a bit of an audit trail. Um, and then uh, you get a list kind of of all the available versions and you can enable that version for your local session or you can enable that for all users once you've determined that that uh, change is desirable. And uh, situation permitting, I will show you a live demo. Let's see. Got to make sure I'm on that screen. New tab. The new tab opened on my screen. Aha. So, normally jstore.org shows the JSTOR logo, as you might imagine. Um, but, well, this is gonna be difficult with a separate screen. I will show you after, in the interest of time. Uh, I'm happy to show you how this works. So, uh, going back over here. Um, this also ultimately allowed us to do parallel development of a whole site-wide redesign. Um, so we, that's good. Um, we about two years ago uh, had an interest in sort of rebranding and, and changing the entire look and feel of the site. Uh, we wanted to do this, normally we want to do incremental development and deliver, deliver value as fast as we can and in small pieces, um, but with something like a project of that nature, we wanted to kind of 
wait until it was all ready and vetted out and, and just so, uh, so that we could flip it on for everyone all at once. Uh, and using that system that I mentioned before, we were able to, to really do that. Um, we one day were able to just turn on the entire uh, redesign for all of our users uh, because we had parallel copies of all these templates uh, that were available. And so we just selected all the ones we wanted, flipped it on, and it all worked. So uh, we did face a couple problems, uh, one of which was this thundering herd issue. So uh, initially we had cached our template content at the consumers, and we had only cached it for some limited amount of time, and uh, there were times when that content fell out of the cache, and then every consumer went to the service at the same time, uh, and the service got bogged down enough that none of them received a response, and so new requests coming in from new users also called the remote service, uh, and it just spiraled out of control. So that was uh, a lesson learned, and we cached indefinitely at the service instead. And um, the cache loader configuration was a bit confusing. It normally is only on in production, so when settings.debug is false. Um, but then if you specify your loaders explicitly, you have to just make sure that it's still only on when you want it to be and off when you want it to be. Uh, we ran into issues where local, in local development, our templates were being cached, so we would make a change in the template and wouldn't be able to see that, that update. Uh, and it just confused us a bit. So um, that file management thing that I showed you is also a little bit clumsy. Um, it's easy to upload the wrong copy of a file or uh, forget to commit a version of a file that you uploaded and things like that. So what's left would be to kind of improve that uh, story around adding and removing layouts and templates, um, but also we may just want to use version control for that because it's already good at at doing exactly that. Um, so thanks, that's it. Um, I also need to mention that I'm writing a book. Uh, it's Practices of the Python Pro. Um, it's the, this code on the screen here can get you 40% off on that for the duration of this conference, but also specifically today, um, all of the Manning books are $25 for print books, so uh, see which one of those might be cheaper if there's a book you're interested in. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you. Do you have any problems with your caching memory management? Like, are you accidentally over caching items and keeping them stored? Or are you able to make sure that you're deleting everything? Um, sorry. Good question. Um, we cache these things separately from most other things. I think we have a cache specifically for this. Uh, and there's a very small handful of templates that we're caching. Uh, so it's it, the way we've chosen to do the infrastructure there, it's very easy to say, cache this forever, we don't care. Uh, eventually things may, f like if you reach the, if you sort of saturate your cache, right, things may eventually fall out, but uh, they'll be the oldest things, right, the least accessed. So uh, we have not run into any, any caching issues at the moment. So I hope I didn't miss this, but um, for your individual apps, do you have a way that they can customize the templates they're requesting, or do they all just get the same template? You know, every single app, if it asks for template A, it's always the same coming out. So it's always the same, but it's still a template. So there, it, it still has the places in the template that you can uh, fill in information. Uh, it has blocks, you can extend it if you like. Uh, it, it's all the same uh, way that the Django template workflow normally works. Uh, we're just getting that initial file from a service instead of the file yeah. system. Good question. Sure. Well, what did you use for feature flags? Uh, that's another talk in itself, but ultimately it's, it's another Django app. Um, we rolled our own partly because of uh, the way certain specifics around our authentication and, and uh, things like that work. But um, I would pro probably recommend like Django, uh, what is it called? Waffle. Uh, I think there's one called Gargoyle too, maybe? Anyone? Anyway, there's a, there's a few libraries out there for you, for sure. 
There's also launch darkly, uh, which is like a fully managed uh, service and API. Have you messed with uh, Redis versus white noise, and do you have a preference and why? I have never used white noise. Um, white noise is for like static files, right? Um, so I, I suppose we could make that work, right? Because they're ultimately just static files. Um, but yeah, we haven't we haven't tried that. I haven't even tried white noise for uh, for like personal apps or anything. So. Um, that could be interesting to explore, though, for sure. Yep. All right. Thank you thank so you. much for joining us. You can use this towel to get over your cold. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>